Uh, my name is Jason Nixon, and I have the privilege of being the member of the Legislative Assembly for the beautiful riding of Rimby Rocky Mountain House Sundry, which of course includes here right now, and the beautiful West Country that we have. And I want to start before we get into official business with thanking you. This is a cold day in February. Uh, everybody who has taken the time to drive here uh, to people are walking. I actually, I got to tell you, if I could get that happening at all my other political town halls, life would be really good. But it shows how important it is, and it shows how seriously you take our backyard and how much you value what we have to the west of us, and how much you value making sure that we can utilize it in the future. So I want to start with a big round of applause for all of you for taking the time to come and show the government how important this is to us. Now, the question is, why are we here? And I think everybody knows why we are here. But the reality is, right now, standing in front of you is an official opposition MLA, not a government MLA. Standing up here and sitting at our, at our table right now are representatives and stakeholders from our community. They're going to spend time trying to answer important questions that, that have come up as a result of some of the rumors that are going on uh, around the eastern slopes uh, in this constituency and elsewhere in Alberta. But the problem is, that's not how it should be happening. I'm happy to come and visit with you all. Most people in this room who know me know I'm not scared to grab a mic and talk a lot. But the reality is, the government is making decisions or indicating that they may make decisions that have an impact on our backyard. And they are only talking to select groups of people at select times. They are not meeting with people. They have been invited to this hall here tonight. They are not here tonight, though we will try to present their position as best that we can. And that is wrong. That is wrong, and I want, if anything that comes out of this, that should be the number one thing, that we expect the Minister of Environment and her staff to come and talk to our community and come and talk to the people that will be impacted by the decisions that they will make in the West Country. And I think everybody agrees with me on that. Now, the, re the reality is, because of that, uh, my guests that are with us tonight uh, and myself will not be able to answer every question because lots of this is rumors. We will do our best, uh, and we will try to show a path forward. We will try to give a history of what has been taking place around the eastern slopes in our constituency uh, and some of the ideas, uh, and, and then take questions from you and answer them as best that we can. Please be patient with us, though, because we don't know. They have not come. They have not included us uh, in, in that conversation. I think that's, that's very important to remember. We will also do our best not to, to spread any more rumors. There are a lot of rumors out there. It's the government's fault, in my opinion, on the way that they've handled it. But we are going to try to stick to facts as best as we can uh, during this conversation. Does that sound fair? OK. With that said, I just want to, uh, again, reiterate the position of the United Conservative Party in this MLA when it comes to this issue. And then we will uh, bring up our guests to start talking about it. And then we'll go with questions. And then I will uh, close things off. Uh, the United Conservative Party and myself believe that the West Country and the Eastern Slopes of Alberta uh, belong to Albertans. We believe uh, that that area is Albertans backyard. It is our backyard and we have every right to utilize it. We believe that it is an important resource. We believe that it is a resource that should be protected for future generations. But we also believe that it is a resource that we can use now while we are protecting it for future generations. We will continue to advocate for that uh, as we go forward on your behalf, you have my assurances on that. I will not change my position on that. We will continue to stand up on that issue for you in Edmonton, where we are outvoted. And where it goes in the coming days, we don't know. But what I do want you to know is that we will not back off on that decision, that that is Albertans' backyards. And before something happens with it, we must consult Albertans. And we must trust the stakeholders that utilize it every day to make sure that we can operate in an effective way. And with that said, we're going to start off with uh, Cal Rakic. How many of you guys know Cal? There's a few more people there that know you, Cal. So Cal's going to come up and introduce himself, and he'll start to give us a little bit of a history of what has taken place uh, in the West Country, and then we'll go from there. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, for those who don't know me, uh, I'm, on, I'm on one of the original members on the Bighorn uh, Backcountry Standing Committee from 2002. I was in, in, uh, in these negotiations back in 2002 uh, when we put this original plan into place. 
Um, I'm also a project manager for uh, the Clearwater Trails Initiative, so you've seen some of the work down in Rig Street and the Sasquatch stuff. Uh, that's work that uh, everybody sitting here, we've been working on, and I'm a regional director for the Albert Off Highway Vehicle Association, and that list goes on, so I won't bore you with that. Um, tonight, uh, I'm just going to go over a quick agenda here so you, you folks understand what we're going to be uh, talking about here. Um, I'm going to talk about the map uh, comparison. There's a bunch of maps out there um, from the, the environmental groups and just show you what that is about. Uh, and then I'm going to swing into uh, the actual Bighorn map and exactly what are we talking about uh, in, in that regard. So we don't get confused. We know what we're talking about when we're talking about the Bighorn. Um, now that portion we had invited um, the... Uh, environment and parks folks to come and speak to that. That's kind of their topic. So um, bear with me. I'm going to take that role on for them. So don't throw nothing at me. I'm just <laughs> doing the best I can. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the stewardship groups that are out in the Bighorn. Uh, within the Clearwater area, we have a bunch of synergy that's going on. Um, the Tom and Jim are going to talk about that. And um, then we'll... Jason and I will kind of go through a little bit of, of where we're at with the North Saskatchewan Regional Plan and why there are so many questions and so many unknowns. So, um, you know, again, we've got to try and get rid of some of these rooms understand that we don't know a bunch of stuff. And we've got Garrett Schmidt, who's the director for Alberta Off-Highway. He's going to look at some solutions, talk to us about some solutions on um, the, you know, the four-point plan. You guys have seen uh, some of that. we got letters around uh, for you to sign uh, to promote that. So, Mike, my light guy at the back. Okay, so I'm going to show you three different maps. This is uh, Alberta Wilderness Association. This is right off their website, um, and they're talking about the Bighorn. The three maps I'm going to show you are, have one common, common um, um, theme to them. This is the Alberta Wilderness Association, and I've got a Canadian Parks and Wilderness. Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society, CPAWS, and then a Love Your Headwaters map, which is basically the same. So all of these maps, you know, this is kind of what the Bighorn looks like now. In their proposal, they're looking to come out to the Forestry Trunk Road with a few chunks out in beyond. Now, last night, this star is Rocky Mountain House. Last night, I was looking at this a little closer, and I was, uh, I noticed that along the rivers, they've also got parks suggested which is interesting because uh, we're also now going through this trout thing that's going to do some closures and Alberta Wilderness Association is a proud partner of that project so I don't know if that's any part of that. The, uh, this is Sea Paws. Now this one gets interesting especially for you landowners. They are also proposing a park over by somewhere around Eckville and they also think there should be a bunch of park on both sides of the river, North Saskatchewan, up and around uh, towards Sunchild. And that, that should be park. A great big chunk here, and I think that'd be about Blue Hill. And uh, this, um, this also in, is park. That would be uh, Ram Mountain up through um, uh, Saunders and up kind of through that stretch. I'm guessing it's kind of... <laughs> they don't make it very clear for you so that you really don't know what, what they're talking about. But again, the forestry trunk road, they're expanding out to the forestry trunk road. Okay, now this is, this is basically the same map as the Sea Paws map. This is Love Your Headwaters. Uh, they've, got, they've got the same chunks of land here um, over by Eckville there and, and all that in the north. I find this one interesting is that the color scheme that they use on it is, uh, makes it very tricky for you to really understand what they're talking about. So those are the maps you see in the media. They're the ones that are, conf you know, you're wondering, scratching your head. That's not what we're talking about here. This lousy map is the Bighorn map that's right off, uh, right out of this, out of, your, out of the brochure. So what I'm going to be doing here, and this is where I'm going to swing into uh, the access management plan and what that's about. And these maps, we've got a whole bunch of them back there for you folks. This is the rule book for the Bighorn. So when we talk about the Bighorn, big map in there, that's what we're talking about. So 
where to find information on the Bighorn backcountry. You go to the Alberta um, Environment and Parks website. You type in uh, Bighorn backcountry, and you'll end up on, on this page. And there is all kinds of information um, on that. You click down in here, it says Bighorn backcountry. It talks about, um, well, it starts uh, outlining what's going on. The bottom part of the uh, bottom part of the page has all the maps, so um, you know know before you go, and and you can download and plan your trips at home. What's interesting and what they've done is, at the bottom they have a section there with geo-referenced maps, and you can download from the site an Avenza app to your phone, and when you Load in these geo-reference maps. Your phone turns into a GPS. You don't need cell service or anything like that. And you can follow yourself around on, out on the trails and that. So this is the website that you're going to go to and, and start getting some of that information. Now to get into a bit of the nuts and bolts about the, uh, uh, the access management plan, again, this brochure is the rule book. Essentially, everything about uh, the Bighorn Backcountry is in that is in is in that brochure. So that's that's an important document. Now, the maps I've got here. This is an important point. The maps I've got here are the 2017 maps, and on the and then and we update them every year as we hum and haw about which trails would remain open and what we're going to do or whatever little rule changes we want to know uh, that we want to do. So make sure when you're using these maps that you uh, uh, these brochure rather that you get the right date because the rules may change. You may end up someplace you you don't want to be. So within, the, within that, you've got user ethics, um, you know, wheels out of water, some equine stuff, um, you know, the human, human waste and all that. We've got the loo with a view out there, so we're uh, trying to provide some toilets for you folks. Also, uh, each public land use zone within the Bighorn, there's six of them. I'm not even going to try and remember what they all are. Each one of them is listed there, and it t talks about what the uses are. Again, know where you are, where you're going, and what you're allowed to, to use, or what you're allowed to do within each of them. Now, we get into how this, this access management plan is, is run and how it's monitored. There's two committees that are in place uh, to try and manage this. And down in here, you click there, it's got uh, monitoring, the monitoring. And you'll, you'll come up with a bunch, a bunch of information. These two, two pages, uh, there's all kinds of information. The, the access management plan is administered by two committees. One is the steering committee, one is the standing committee. The steering committee is essentially all of uh, the department, uh, environment and parks and tours and all that, and um, that take advice from the standing committee. And then they, they uh, enact whatever, for the most part, whatever the standing committee uh, puts, puts forward. So when you can click on this, within that, uh, within this page, all of our minutes for the last 15 years are all available there. You can see what we talk about and, and how things kind of come to be in that. So um, there's a lot of good information in there. So the standing committee is what uh, our stakeholders, the stakeholders are in. And I know there's a whole bunch of standing committee folks here. Um, and what we do is we meet qu quarterly, I guess, and uh, you know, look at our enforcement numbers and go through all sorts of uh, um, you know, proposals that come forward, uh, learn about the fire stuff, the, the, uh, the, the burns that they've got going out in Nordeg and that, and you know, talk about what's going on in the Bighorn. The way this committee is set up is through, uh, it isn't Cal as Alberta Off Highway, I am a summer motorized representative. So we are set up uh, with uh, the values in that. So Clearwater County, summer motorized, equine, mountain biking, winter motorized, fixed commercial, trapping. That's the way we're set up. So as we c come on to issues and that, we, we 
make recommendations to the steering committee, and then, then that is what is enacted in there. And then once a year, we go through our map and, and uh, say, okay, so what do we need to change uh, in order to make everybody aware of what we're going on, what's going on? Okay, so that's the government part of it. Now I'm a volunteer. I want to talk about these folks that do stand on that, that sit on the st uh, standing committee. Uh, there's three primary stewardship groups, four, um, is, is Friends of the Eastern Slopes, the Bighorn ATV Society, and uh, the old Snowmobile Club, the Albert Equine Federation, they contribute a lot. Um, we've done, uh, the mountain bike guys have done a lot of work. Alberta Conservation, they've done some trails in that, and we've got flood guys that have done trail work in that as well. So I just want to touch base with you folks and, and just let you know how much work that goes on out there for the volunteers. So when you're going out there and you see the bridges, you see the trails, you see those campgrounds, the campgrounds, the way we've got it set up is that Friends of the Eastern Slopes are administering that. Um, and a lot of that is because of their experience at the Bighorn uh, Campground and their expertise with building campgrounds for uh, horse use, which uh, creates, has uh, is, is got a lot of challenges within, within itself. So these folks, um, they look after uh, gonna, the, the Bighorn uh, um, Campground, Eagle Creek, Cutoff, Hummingbird, they're out to seven mile flats they got one. I think they can do a toilet out of Cow Lake, I think now. Um, so again, the vo you know, it's all volunteer work when you're out there camping at Hummingbird uh, in that. Uh, join, make sure you, you contribute to these folks. Uh, the Bighorn Heritage ATV Society. Um, bit off, we bit off a little more than we could chew there, but uh, we're, uh, they're, um, very ambitious folks, and the amount of time and effort all of these volunteers put in is absolutely phenomenal. They take their holidays, um, days off, and they're out there working. They take their own equipment out there. Will, Will Paradis is probably our lead guy out there, and I think he's on his third tractor. So he is, you know, this is, this is the type of dedication that's going on out there. Um, the volunteers have spent around, well, we're going to say a low number. We we're trying to account that uh, this year. A low number of $1.3 million in the last 50, uh, 15 years since 2002. Okay, so that is volunteer hours. That's contractor contributions. We have contractors that will come out, donate time and equipment. Uh, they'll donate materials and that. Uh, so these bridges, these culverts, uh, sundry Forest Products, they contribute an awful lot in, in materials and that. And we do it as a community. Our old snowmobile club, they primarily working in, um, in Cutoff Creek and trying to get the trails up into Scalp Creek. The, the top bridge there, <laughs> that's actually, uh, the flood guys put that in over Timber Creek. That's a big bridge. But we needed a big bridge. It's a bull trout stream. Plus, in order for us to get further up into, up into the hills to, to do the work, you got to get a dozer in there, and you got to have bridges to, to try and get equipment over, uh, over these. And these uh, Cutoff Creek have also been designed so that uh, they accommodate the horse and wagon as well. So a big part of, you know, with this bridge, and you see some of the new trail here that was uh, Michael Doyle and company had built, um, uh, accommodate, accommodating the horse, the horse and wagon as well as the quads and the sleds. What's important is that we eliminated around 16 crossings on the Clearwater River and various streams in that. So um, it's, it's pretty important work. So good evening, thanks for all coming. Um, I'm gonna take a bit of a different perspective. I work with Sundry Forest Products. And the picture is meant to be as it is. Um, I've been around the forestry game for many years now. And as you guys know, it's a struggle. People don't want access. People want more access. Groups don't get along. It just is a constant battle. And there needs to be leadership from government because government owns the land. Government needs to determine how that land is going to be used. Just a side note about us. Um, most of us know us as the old Sun Pine. We're owned by West Fraser since 2005. 
Uh, we're a fairly significant company in the forest sector. We have mills across Alberta, Saskatchewan, and in the United States. More closely to home, we have a sawmill down to Sundry, and we have a laminated veneer plant up by Rocky. And the area that I'm going to talk about is this area here. It's known as the Forest Management Agreement area um, to us because that's the area that we've been um, given the rights to manage the timber within there, and that's the area that we feed the mills for, uh, for employment and so on within the local communities. In 1992, we established a group called SPIRT, um, interesting name. I was going for the name Spirit. It ran a little bit short. And what it stands for is the Sundry Forest Products Public Involvement Roundtable. And on that group we have a bunch of members that are there representing a value. So we look at the value of interests that are involved in the forest management agreement area and try to get those people to the table to give us advice on how we're going to work through some of the forest management issues. So you can see from the list there, this list does change once in a while. We have people on that group that have been there since 1992, so 25 years in the making. So this group, back in about 1995, started a, a subcommittee. It was called the Subcommittee on Access. And they were very interested in this topic. And if you want to get any of these guys engaged on the topic of access, it's hard to shut them down. Um, because everybody is very eager to talk about that subject. But these were some of the areas that they talked about. Um, during that time, there was lots of promotional information put out. For example, uh, as a company, we were running ads in the um, hunting, and guide, or hunting regulations, fishing regulations. Um, we were doing TV shows, uh, Fishing Alberta. I don't know if any of you remember that TV show, but we did a couple of shows with them dedicated to talking about what to do in your quad when you're close to water. So this was up in Lynx Creek, and the whole idea was knowing that guys are running across creeks and so on, let's do it the right way. Let's not do it the wrong way, trying to educate people. We were trying to get the federal government involved at the time. Uh, that was a bit of a struggle. We couldn't get them involved, but nonetheless, we went out and we tried to educate people about how to properly use um, their quads and how to respect the land. We have concerns about access, and our concerns are around safety. Obviously, when you've got narrow roads with logging trucks on it, it's a little bit different. The attitudes in Alberta, I've got to say, are quite different. I'm, I'm from Alberta. I understand that. But when you go to BC, you get out, out of the way of a logging truck here. I don't know what it is, but people just feel that they have to hog the road when the logging truck's coming. And um, so we have concerns about safety. There's the economic environmental component of roads. Roads take up a lot of land base. If you're a farmer and you've got roads across your landscape, that means you can't grow crop on it. And we view trees as a crop. So the more roads in the landscape, the more crop takes away from us. That gets to the, public or the productive land base. Fire risk is always an issue for us. If we had a fire the size of Fort McMurray on this landscape here, our business would be done. And then vandalism. Everybody knows it. It's, it's rampant throughout the whole area. And we certainly see it on our logging sites. We're constantly losing... Uh, fuel out of equipment, safety equipment, guys go for joy rides. It's pretty crazy on what goes on out there, and you guys know that. Not sure. Some of the reasons that access is being, stricted, or is being restricted is driven by this guy here. This, uh, lots of grizzly bears out there, and if anybody's interested in knowing how the government came up with the census on grizzly bears, Gord Stenhouse will be in Rocky. Next Wednesday, unfortunately, it's Valentine's Day, but that's the only day we could get them lined up. And he's going to be talking about the fact that they're going to be doing a re-census for this area. So we are currently in BMA 4, that's Bear Management Area 4. It goes from Highway 11 south to Highway 1. So they did a census back about 12 years ago, looking at how many bears were here. I think they came up with 45 bears. And depending on where you sit, I can tell by the laughs, I agree with you, there's a lot more bears out there. We track all our bear sightings, and if, if you take every bear sighting for what it is, we count them every year, more than 45. Nonetheless, I know Gord, Gord's a good guy, but there's a real opportunity this time for everybody to get engaged. And I don't want to take too much away from Gord's presentation, but they have apps developed for phones. So if you're out in the backcountry and you see a bear, you can take the location, send it to Gord. They also have sample uh, little bottles you can have to collect scat and they can distinguish between black bear and grizzly bear, and all of that will be used to determine the senses. I've also talked about the fact we need to extend the range. 
Lots of people around here are seeing bears where we've never seen them, especially when we get out into the agricultural land of the east. So that will be coming up next week. But that's one of the critters that drives us on access control. The other thing is bull trout. So we work a lot with ACA doing inventory on bull trout in the streams. And uh, certainly there's lots of um, concern about bull trout. Both of those are listed as species at risk. And there's lots of controls being put on it. Both of those are driven by access, at least for our business. And so there's restrictions on not having more than 0.6 kilometers of road per square kilometer. And if we start to exceed that, we have to start to take access out. So when you look at that, there's lots of road that's being built, and we know exactly how much road is being built, not by ourselves, but by everybody else on the landscape, and we're trying to manage to that parameter. It also means that a lot of road's going to get reclaimed. So there's lots of activity going on out there as far as road reclamation and road construction. In that comes a lot of access control. So we've been directed by the government that some of our roads are not going to be open to public access. And I can tell you just about every new road that we built now, the requirement is we put a gate on it. This is the Falls Creek Road. It's been crazy on that road. I don't know what it is about people, but they tend to ignore signs. They tend to ignore gates. Um, we get locks knocked off. Guys have been getting fined thousands of dollars. And continuously, people have been going in there. I think it's starting to settle down now. I think people are starting to understand the new reality. But I got to just point out, it's not us telling you that you can't go on that road. We're being directed by the government to restrict access in those areas because of some of the critters that are on that landscape. Right or wrong, that's the direction we've been given. We also have a lot of roads that I would call sort of a non-permanent road. This is an old road that was in Lynx Creek. You can see the age of the picture, 2003. At the time, we were building quite a few uh, timber bridges, and we left some of those roads in place. And those roads we're going to be back using. So this road we stopped using in about 19, or about the 2000 mark. We're in there right now, starting to upgrade those roads. We're going to be in there again to take some more timber out. Then that road's going to go back to its sort of uh, deactivated stage for a number of years. What we're lobbying and what we're getting good success working with the guys from the government at a regional level and some extent to the guys in Edmonton, they're really supportive of these roads when we're not using them, being used as uh, quad access roads or bike access roads, whatever access it might be, but using it for recreational access. And I think this is a really good opportunity because there's a good road network out there already. They provide a really good opportunity. It's not for the guys that want to get out there and mud it up and so on. It's going to be a good opportunity for people to get in there. The Falls Creek, if anybody's been in there, we're just about ready to shut down operations probably in a couple years. I think, and Cal's been in there a number of times, that there's going to be a great opportunity to take a family in there and tour around on your ATV and look at some of the countryside. Uh, those opportunities are being provided. And again, we're getting good support for doing that. We're also, as Cal suggested, supporting some of the other initiatives. There's the Rig Street Initiative. There's the Metals Initiative just south of the North Saskatchewan. So we're trying to create those opportunities within the forest management agreement area so people can still enjoy getting out with families, getting out on your own, and touring around and having a look at what's going on out there. And Jim, Jim Duncan with Clearwater County is going to talk a little bit more in detail about some of the initiatives by the Clearwater Trail Group. The other thing we're looking at is, is trying to deal with some of the safety issues. We see this all over. We see this kind of activity happening on well sites. And no, it's not our activity, but as an industrial partner out there, we're trying to get people off of those areas. It's not safe to camp on that wellhead, not safe to camp on that pipeline, and get them into places where people can camp, where they're going to be safe and still get access to the trails. So that's one of the components we're working on as well. I think everybody's heard the stat, but anywhere from 45 to 60,000 people are random camping in this area immediately around here during the May long weekend. There's a huge amount of people here and we need to think about what kind of impact that's having and how we might deal with that and the management thereof. As a company, we look at sort of categories of trails. We look at what we call recognized trails. And there used to be that system where you could adopt a trail. And those are very important to us because those are the type of trails that we don't want to get wiped out. Seismic lines, that's a whole other issue. There's a tremendous amount of seismic line network out there. They were never intended to be a trail. 
All they were was used for geographical or geophysical activity. They weren't intended to be a trail. They weren't developed to be a trail. Many of those go through muskegs or really sensitive areas. So we're working with the government to try to remove some of those off the landscape. Across the area that have trails to set out their traps and so on. We work with them to try to protect their trails. And then we have also what we call user trails. So those are trails that are well known by people that are identified. So when we advertise our open house meetings that we have every year in Rocky, Nordig, and Sundry, we're hoping that people come forward, look at the maps and say, you know what, this trail is really important to us. Because without knowing that that trail is important to you, I can guarantee that it may or may not be there in the future. And this is what we're trying to remove. It doesn't make any sense that you have to leave every seismic line in place when you have this type of activity that's occurring on the landscape. And this is just one snapshot. I know it's not like that everywhere. And this is just one graphic example, but certainly I think we could do with one access route through there than having 20 of them. This is a typical seismic line running through our cut block. So we'll make sure that we're not moving slash across that seismic line, that people can still get across those trails that are recognized as people should be using. The intent here is to create a quality experience for people out there, not to uh, basically restrict people from getting into where they want to go. And we're not talking just about motorized access. I know this is kind of the focus for this meeting, but we're also concerned about some of the other activities out there and working with the different groups. Recently, we've been working with some of the bike groups about some of the trails they have out by Baseline Mountain. I didn't realize that Baseline Mountain is probably the, the go-to place for Alberta downhill mountain bikers. And certainly, we're working with them trying to figure out how we can harvest in an area and maintain their trails and give them a good quality experience as well. This map is, I don't know why it turned up that way, but that map is also there. So again, this is uh, the forest management agreement area and we have the timber rights in that area, but what it doesn't do is it doesn't give us the right to tell people you can't come in here. We have to work with other stakeholders to make sure that the activities are still going to continue and we take the direction from the government. The area, and again, I apologize when I did this uh, presentation, this was a different color. Uh, that area, again, look at the size of it. It's almost as big as the FMA. It's smaller than Banff National Park. Um, and if you add up the areas out there, there's quite a bit of area for everybody to enjoy themselves. And the example I always use, if you're a, uh, a mountain biker, and you're okay with looking at some oil and gas activity and looking at some forestry activity, this is probably a pretty good place for you to go. If you don't want to see that, then maybe you're going to go to the Bighorn because there is no commercial logging occurring there. That is one of those uh, myths that's out there uh, generated by some people on the Internet suggesting that there's commercial logging going on there. There is no commercial logging going on in the Bighorn. And if you're looking for an opportunity that may be even different, and I, there's some places you can't even ride your mountain bike in Banff National Park, maybe there's a place for you to go in Banff National Park. But I like to think from a landscape perspective, there's something for everybody there which is currently the way it's managed. I'm not sure why we need to change that up, but uh, certainly our effort is trying to um, support the groups that are out there, like the Bighorn Heritage Group, like uh, this Clearwater Trail Initiative to make sure that we're doing our part as a community member to support the activities that are occurring on the landscape. Thank you. We're going to have uh, Jim Duncan from Clearwater County, of course, a longtime counselor with uh, Clearwater County, but also does a lot of work with uh, the Trails Initiative out there. Thank you, Jason. And they'll just get the uh, slides up. Yes, I'm with Clearwater County. A lot of my committee work in the last seven years has been with the sort of outdoor stuff, the recreation side of it, the uh, egg services, Clearwater Land Care, and some of the other stewardship activities that we're a partner with, with all these other groups that are in the county as well. So as you've kind of heard today, there's, we call them the three E's quite often, the education, enforcement, and engineering. And they're all part of being the successful management out in, on the landscape, whether it's recreation or, or just uh, even with industry. So on the education side, you know, education is probably the thing that's going to be the most effective over the long term. 
we just can't put enough enforcement people out there and we just don't have enough money to do all the building we would like to do or all the bridges, all the trail work that we want to do. So we've had this uh, Sasquatch program going now for about four years. It's been a, a positive message. I think you've probably all seen the signs. It's been very rewarding for me to work on this one. It, uh, it took off as soon as we kind of got it started and we put a lot of the big signs up. You've seen the uh, brochures around and the, I see the kids are picking up the activity book that's at the back as well. We've uh, exported that program out. There is five counties now involved putting up signs, taking this positive message out there. And that would include uh, Mountain View County to the south of us, ourselves. North of us is Brazeau, Yellowhead, and Greenview. So pretty much along the east slopes, we're seeing that message go forward. And it's always been a positive message. We're not telling people, you don't do this. We're giving them that positive uh, way to do something and, and make it, uh, you know, welcome to our backyard, but please enjoy it with respect. So Clearwater Trails Initiative, I sit on that group. We're a synergy group. We've recently become a society. It did actually, as Cal was started that one way, or was with the initial group back in the early 2000s, it kind of went defunct because industry was not at the table. So we've, it's been revived since about 2013 or 14. And it's a multi-stakeholder group. So we bring industry there, government, which includes both the county and the provincial government on a local level, as well as now we see some people from Edmonton coming down to our meetings as well. And our focus has been more, and sorry, individual citizens sit on our group as well. It's being synergy. It's kind of like tonight, everybody is allowed in the room. So the uh, focus for this group is more the vacant crown land. And that's that section between the public land use zones on the, on the forestry trunk roads and then out to the settled area here at Rocky Mountain House. So as you, you've heard tonight, right, those are lands where it is legal for you to go out and ride and camp on those properties. But there is industry on that landscape as well. And that's been a problem in some cases for industry, as Tom was pointing out, there is the, uh, the issue with people camping on the well sites and occasionally with repeated use, if the, if the area is wet, you see some exposed pipes and that kind of stuff out there as well. And that's a concern for industry. So industry came to the table with us and we're searching for some solutions on that, working from the ground up. And we're able to you know, do some work. We've, we've uh, built a bunch of trails in the Rig Street area, about our revives are actually just not new trails, not much of it's new, mostly it's just revamping the old trails, but also putting in the bridges and also tying those to campsites. So out there on the landscape, there's all those, uh, not really abandoned oil sites, but they're reclaimed oil sites. Once they're reclaimed and they go back to the province, then they're ideal campsites. And we encourage people to use those as opposed to camping on the, the well site that's active. It's, uh, it's, it's part of a long-term plan and I think and with this, this kind of work, it's, it's not only that we're doing this work, but we're also exploring and, and finding those ways to do it legally, to make it a recognizable trail plan that's out there on the landscape. We have to, uh, you can't just go out and do this stuff, you have to have approvals. And the guys in here in Rocky have been great through the, the provincial government here. Wayne Crocker and Don Livingston and, and their group, they've helped us out a lot, and they're the ones that do have to approve this work that we do. But we're exploring ways to do that, to put a trail on a pipeline and make it legal there, to, to uh, have a bridge that's on a pipeline or right beside a pipeline. You'll notice too, we, uh, some of the stakeholders involved with us on Clearwater Trails are also the grazing holders, and we've got, got the uh, quad gates in places as well, so that we're looking after their interests. The trappers can be part of our, part of our group as well and have some input into, into our trail management out there. And Tom mentioned, of course, the, the, this ability we're looking at to use a logging road as a trail while they're not need, in need of it. And this is the Meadows project he spoke of, and we're just getting rolling on that one. And for us, that's about a $250,000 project, which would include some bridges and trail work, but also, I say, using some of these roads for trails, which is an excellent alternative. These guys know how to build the roads. They're always on, this, on really good land. They're staying up on the high, high ground and that makes it uh, an excellent quad trail as well. They're often narrowed up just for quad access, but uh, they can be opened up again when they have to come back for some more cuts. I would talk a little bit about also the uh, Clearwater County has been promoting the rail, sorry, the rail trail, which goes from Rocky to Nordig. We've built a little bit of that from the trunk road back into Nordig and then from Nordig to Beaver Dams. We also have a, an industrial 
site or sorry, industrial subdivision, not subdivision, industrial lots for sale out near the trunk road, and two of those lots have been dedicated as a staging area. So there's access to the trail out there. This has been a, a plan that the, the county has kind of put up to the government for at least 15 years or more. Uh, with that plan comes the node development. So Nordig is actually, we refer to it as a node. It's a hamlet of ours, but we're developing things there in a historic way, developing trails. We have actually 1,500 acres that encompasses Nordig that the county owns. And we, will, we are doing some trail development there as tying those trails to the trails that are outside of, of Nordig as well. Other nodes would be like Saunders Alexo and White Goat Wilderness. Uh, those plans have been in place with the government again, but we haven't been able to move forward on them. One of the drawbacks there is right now, generally approvals for recreational development in the West Country, whether that is in the Bighorn area or in that vacant crown land, those approvals are on 20 year leases. So that makes it a little bit tough for developers to commit. It's not long enough time and it makes it tough for the county as well because if we develop say access or power into a node like Saunders Alexo, then we would like to be able to recover some of those costs by selling lots or for a campground or something and then through taxes over 20 or 30 or 40 years, we can recover those, those, that public money through taxes and then pay for those systems. But right now it's at, at a 20 year lease so that's kind of one of the negotiating points if we move forward with this is to try and extend those leases for longer. Uh, Nordig has the historic site that we've developed as well and uh, it's been a big hit out there. Lots of, of tourists visit that one each year. I also work with the North Saskatchewan Watershed Alliance and that's a, uh, we'll call it more of a, uh, North Saskatchewan Watershed Alliance is a WPAC, Watershed Policy Advisory Council. So the government has divided the province into seven watersheds and the North Saskatchewan one in the middle, it goes right from the headwaters all the way through to the border. So those WPACs are kind of, their mandate is to promote good stewardship and do some of the research that's needed, some of the inventories, and uh, some of the, also some of the groundwork, some of the projects that help promote water quality, water quantity, and good stewardship of the land. So the North Saskatchewan watershed's been active for many years. Uh, Pat Alexander, a former councillor in our reef, chaired that group for a long time and uh, I attend some of their meetings now as well. We've also, that group is, has kind of three subcommittees and the subcommittee in this area is called the Headwaters Alliance and that's another one I partake in and we're, we're doing that work in the headwaters, looking at those inventories. We take part in uh, water quality testing and Clearwater County actually sends staff out to collect water samples. So we're getting that background data, that baseline data that's really important if we want to talk about how we're gonna manage the land. We want to know that the water quality is good and it is still very good in the North Saskatchewan River. But we're, we've got the baseline data, if it changes, it should show up in all that testing and it can be part of a management plan. With the county, we've been doing some survey work as well and I only brought one slide from the survey, but it's the one right here. And we had over 500 people respond this past summer to the survey and we were asking them where they're from and, and what they're doing out in the West Country. We recorded all that so we know, again, numbers. You need that data to be able to have good management. This part of the pie chart here said 65% of people were in favor of paying a user fee for random activities in the West Country. So that's an important piece of data to take to the province that there is a way to manage this. We can do it if people are, people are willing to pay for even random activities. Tom mentioned some of the large numbers of people that come out and this slide just demonstrates we've had traffic counters out in seven different spots for a number of years and it catches that traffic going into various areas so we actually can quantify the rise in traffic and we do in some of those really busy areas go up to three or four hundred vehicles per day on a long weekend whereas it's like 20 during the week. So that's kind of the, the background on the activities that we're involved in. Like we've You've heard lots of information here on, on what groups are doing out there and how active they've been on a volunteer basis. And we're working from the ground up. But this plan has to also come from the, ground, from the top down. And that's the North Saskatchewan Regional Plan. And I think the guys are going to talk about that a little bit more from now on. It's, uh, that's the one that's going to be the overall arching plan. But within that plan, there will be sub-basin plans as well. So the, the North Saskatchewan Regional Plan is a 30,000 foot look at this whole region. It's not going to be the details on everything, but it can set aside conservation areas or protected areas, but it can also set aside areas for management through other means as well, whether that's public land use zone or wildland parks. 
And other than that, I think that's all for me. And I think we'll have a bit of a wrap up from Jason and Cal, and then we'll have some questions. Thanks, Jim. We're actually really going to qu quickly bring up uh, Garrett uh, Schmidt, who with the Alberta Off Highway uh, Vehicle Association, just to talk about their four-point plan. This has this is not just about quads. This is not just about ATVs. We're going to get into that in a minute. But while we have Garrett here, we'll bring him up real quick, and then we'll we'll get into the uh, regional plan, what's taking place in our backyard, and to what you guys are all here for. We'll get you the mics, and we'll go from there. Let's give him a round of applause, Garrett. Okay, thanks everyone. Can you guys hear me back there? So, I don't have a presentation. I'm just going to talk. But, just want to quickly put one thing up while we talk about it. Just wanted to talk. The, the Alberta Off Highway, first off, uh, it was started in 1983 by a gentleman named Rudy Zasko, who was on the founding board. Rudy owned Scona Cycle. Uh, Rudy was, he's been a rider his whole life in Alberta. Um, he started up the organization to provide for stewardship, designating trails, working to promote the recreation in the backcountry. Um, Rudy's 87. I think he was riding bikes until he was 76, faster than me anyways. But um, he's been around for a long time, and the organization's been working for 35 years. All the directors are 100% volunteers. We have just one kind of mission. We are passionate about the sport, but we're very passionate about providing sustainability of this recreation. Um, for 2009 to two, or 2007 to 2017, registration fees, there's been $50 million collected in registration fees. None of it's gone back to the user clubs. Uh, it just goes straight into general revenue. So there's other jurisdictions, Ontario, Quebec, Idaho, Montana. There's guidelines for developing plans that have worked in other jurisdictions. Alberta is not alone on this planet with off-road environmental issues and population growth. So the thing with recreation is that we have been working very hard on four-point plans that have been worked successful in other jurisdictions. The number one thing is planning. Users know the recreation they want. You guys know what you want to do out there. Users have to be involved in planning. We need to build trail systems that are for the users that support the values of what people want to do out there. So that's the first step. So we work with the framework. We have been continuously offering the government our input into trail planning and design. It's a group called National Off-Highway Vehicle Council, NOVAC, down in the States. They've got a book about that thick. Tells you how to do trails, how to avoid, how to mitigate issues, how to go around sensitive areas, how to deal with repairing areas. The idea of the intent is to keep people on the landscape, but manage the recreation so we don't have the problems that we've seen elsewhere. That's step one is plan. That's planning. Step two is funding. There's no funding network for the clubs to be able to sustain this. The, the Bighorn guys, um, Friends of Eastern Slopes, they're all, they're all volunteer guys. Uh, Crow's Nest Pass, you guys are aware of Castle, obviously heard it in the news. That's volunteers, Cal volunteers. All these guys are volunteers. So they're out there with very, if any, funding that's coming back from registration at all to be able to maintain these trails. So when you look at a trail and it's beat up, what would Highway 2 look like if we never maintained it? And it was done by the volunteers that drove on it, right? So we need to have a funding system. It's the truth. What would Highway 2, right? So, but the idea is that we've got a funding model that's been proven on Ontario and proven in Quebec. So part of the second part of our four-point plan is we want some of that registration money back. I don't think there's any users in the room, shoot me, there's not users in the room that would say, I'll pay another 20 bucks. If I get 20 bucks back off my registration, it actually goes to those guys trying to maintain trails. If we don't, <laughs> and 
it doesn't have to, we're already paying registration so we'll pay more for the recreation we all I fully believe that everybody in this room wants to preserve the environment preserve the recreation and preserve their lifestyle we're not out there wanting to destroy the environment so we can enjoy it every single person I talk to whether on a dirt bike side by side it doesn't matter what they're doing whether you fish hunt camp if you're using that out there that's because you love nature. You're out there because you want to be out there and experience it, right? So that's the second part is building the funding model. Third, enforcement. Nobody wants garbage back in the bush. When we love the environment, last thing we want to see is LCD TVs on fire in some bush, right? We don't want those issues. We don't want somebody taking Tom's hose and skid steers going for joy rides. But if we don't provide meaningful recreation on designated trails, this problem gets worse. People are not going to stop recreating. It's not going to happen. They're just going to go elsewhere. Then the pressures are going to go up. The problem gets bigger. So we want proper enforcement. There's report a poacher. Why can't we build systems that's resort, report, I won't say it, but report that guy. Right? So we need to be able to have that enforcement. From registration money comes enforcement. And the last one, stewardship. Because I don't think, I'll go back to Highway 2. If we took all, this, all the signs off Highway 2 and just hired police to tell everybody what the speed was, we're going to spend so much on enforcement, it's not, it's, it's, it's not going to work. We need education and stewardship. We need the government to work with the provincial organization to support a flow on messaging and communication that is the same for everyone. We don't want guys out there going off cutting through the trees. Like Jim said, and Tom said, you know, there's a proper way to cross the creek. Waters are sensitive areas. We don't got guys ripping through there, right? But we need education. We need signs. So that's kind of the basis points of the four-point plan. One thing I want to talk about real quick was we know where we're at. Down in Castle, and this is a very different location, but down in Castle there was a wildland park, a provincial park, and there was a framework system. The framework went 15 years, went through the SSRP, it was completed, then there was an amendment, and everything that was in the SSRP didn't happen. OHV was out, was it. So, we're concerned we continuously offer solutions to the government, but they're not listening to us. So we're not going to stop. We're not going away. We're not going to keep championing for this sport, but we believe environmentally sustainable use. There is a way to stay here without having to go here, because how do you build roads? You got a sensitive area? You mitigate it and you deal with it, right? So I don't think removing people from the landscape is a solution. I think providing meaningful trails, creating a funding model, creating enforcement, and creating stewardship programs so we educate people and give them a place to ride, that's going to be the start. And that's never happened in Alberta. It's never happened. So that's what we're pushing for. Uh, thanks, Garrett. We're going to bring uh, Cal up real quick to just talk about what the difference is out here between here and the castle, where the planning process has been in this area up till now when these rumors started, uh, and then we're going to uh, get the mics out there. We'll start taking questions. Go ahead, Cal. Thank, thank you so much for your patience. We're going through a lot of information here, and and a lot of the stuff you know we're kind of talking about. Well, we're not talking about the bighorn. I mean, we're here for the bighorn. I want you folks to realize that there's a lot of community work that is going into this whole county. And, and you know, if we're looking at the vacant crown land between uh, Highway 22 uh, and, and the Bighorn, a tremendous amount of work is going in there. And, and relate how that is, is with how important the Bighorn is in fitting this all together uh, for, for all of our recreational uses um, that that we're interested in in there my lights can I have my lights down please somebody thanks Mike 
Um, okay, just real quickly here. Um, there's. I just want to go over. I, I'm a government guy again. I'm talking for the government because they're not here. Um, just want to go quickly over the North Saskatchewan Regional Plan and why we are at where we're at and why there's so much frustration. All this is on the, the internet and that's why I'm using these web pages so that you folks can look and it, uh, can't poke finger at me that Rakic was uh, giving you a bunch of BS. It's here, this is the government process th that's in place. So if you go to uh, land use, landuse.alberta.ca, you end up on um, the land use page and this is where there you you start and can look at the regional plans the province is broken up into seven watersheds um, the lower Athabasca that's at Fort McMurray country that plan was uh, completed here a number of years back the South Saskatchewan regional plan the SSRP that Garrett referred to uh, was two years ago I think it got signed off and right now that's in the hopper is the North Saskatchewan Regional Plan. So you go to regional plans and you end up um, down in the bottom here. You can pick each one of these. And there's all kinds of information on each one of them. The guiding documents on the land use framework. This is important stuff. This is how the province is going to be planned out into the future. Um, and, and how land use is going to go. It always swings down into the environmental side of it and it comes around to land use access. The land use framework talks about balancing the environment, the social needs and the economic needs. The social and the economic needs always seem to get dropped out and then we always go into the environmental. The social is all you folks sitting here and why are you here and why is that country out there important? And we need to communicate that, find a way to measure it, and put it into this whole framework. So right now, um, a bunch of work has been done on the North Saskatchewan Regional Plan. Uh, the phase one, which includes the Regional Advisory Council, and I'll, mention, I'll call it the RAC, um, has gone through its process. It's, uh, I don't know, there's 12, 13 prominent Albertans. I know there's one RAC member in here. Um, and they, they went through about a one-year, 16-month um, process of gathering information and learning about the North Saskatchewan watershed. Now, the North Saskatchewan watershed goes from B.C. all the way to Saskatchewan, so it's a pretty big uh, patch of land. It's very diverse from the headwaters that we're sitting in here all the way out to that country in Lloyd Minster and every little issue in between the cities, the towns and all that. Uh, these RAC members, they had to scratch their heads and come up with advice to the government as to how are we going to, on a high level, uh, manage, manage the, the lands. That RAC report has not been um, released and it's been promised for about um, oh, about a year now. I think the key promise is it's gonna it's gonna be released. It kickstarts the next part of of um, the planning process. There'll be consultations. So when the RAC report comes out, there'll be consultations, and then they'll come up with uh, a draft plan, and then there'll be consultations, and that that's the way it's supposed to work through the Land Stewardship Act. There is a process um, that that is written. Um, so we are at a point right now, and this is where the frustration is landing, is this whole process is stalled. So we don't know what the RAC report says. The, our RAC members have been very good at honoring their confidentiality document that they signed and won't tell us. But then it leaves us with a bunch of uh, us folks wondering, okay, so what's going to happen? We've got the rumors. Are they going to make a park? Um, you know, and we've watched what happened down in the castle. Uh, and actually, the minister did follow the process there for the South Saskatchewan. Um, so, you know, as, as devious as that whole thing was, um, it, it did follow the process. So that's where we're at, folks, is we're, we're stalled in the process. Now, there is, the, <laughs> the minister 
does she's she's uh, the minister is written into a lot of acts can really do whatever she wants you know if if she doesn't have to follow that process or prior to releasing the rack report which kickstarts the process she can change land uses and that we don't know and and we just want to you're going to hear a lot of i don't knows to your questions because we are stalled at this point so i just want to make that clear why there's why there's a lot of uncertainty and unknowns. Uh, again, let's give these guys a round of applause for trying to bring us up to date. Uh, this is an extremely complicated issue that has been going on for a long time, so it's impossible to try to cover all that in a short period of time. But we wanted to try to bring you up to speed on what we know. Uh, I think this part that we're going to do now is the most important part, so we can start talking about what you want to talk about. So.